On May 16th, Dr. Jordan B. Pearson went on Twitter.com and posted this picture of the cover for Sports Illustrated Swimsuit 2022. The annual issue featured the Japanese-Dutch model and singer-songwriter Yumi Nu, making it the publication's first ever edition to feature a plus-size model of Asian descent. Commenting on the feature, Nu said, It's amazing. I'm on cloud nine. This is nothing I could prepare for. It's unexpected. I feel like we're in a place right now where people are making space for more diversity on magazine covers. It's a big time for Asian American people in the media. Well, that's nice, isn't it? But not to everyone. As one example, Jordan Peterson, one of the most famous public intellectuals on earth, had other thoughts, which I will now read to you in what I believe will be an uncanny impression. Sorry, not beautiful. A new amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. It's a conscious progressive attempt to manipulate and retool the notion of beauty, reliant on the idiot philosophy that such preferences are learned and properly changed by those who know better. But don't let the facts stop you. Now, if it looks a bit like I'm going after low-hanging fruit here, it's because I am. But I do want to talk about these tweets because I think they're a lot more interesting than they look. It's been almost a month since they were posted, and honestly, I've become kind of obsessed with them. I've lost sleep thinking about them. Sometimes, I see them in my dreams. Like, it's a picture of a plus-size model in a magazine, and just look at how much he's managed to make of that with so few words. The assertiveness, the confidence in his own claims, the scientific posturing, the catastrophizing, the f- Sass. Just look at how heavy these claims are. Nu is categorically not beautiful. The attempt to make her beautiful is authoritarian. Progressives are consciously trying to manipulate and retool the notion of beauty. The idea that beauty preferences are learned is an idiot philosophy. And to back all this up, he posts two links which apparently contain the facts. So I think we should take a look at the research that Jordan Peterson one of the most famous public intellectuals on earth has decided to use to back up these positions. But before we do that, um, just one second. Hey. Hey, come here. Oh. No, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Don't worry. Look, just, just, just come here. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Do you in fact use the internet? Do you like to be safe when you're using the internet? Are you tired? of being cringe. Well then you should be using Atlas VPN. A VPN works by making online traffic move through an encrypted tunnel. This protects you from online trackers, keeps you safe from Wi-Fi dangers and dodgy websites, and it hides your IP. If you're a boomer like me and you want to hear that in simple terms, it masks your identity when you're online. But what else can it do? (laughs) I'm so glad you asked. Personally, I like to take a look at what's available on Netflix Japan. But instead of having to fly to Japan like some kind of chump, I can just change my location using my VPN. Are you on a Mac? Yeah, no problem. You can use Atlas VPN on unlimited devices. It works on Windows, Apple, Android, or iOS. All you need to do is click the link in the description and you can get three years of Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month. That's literally the cost of something that costs $1.99 a month. And there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Anyway, let's get back to it. The first study Peterson cited in his tweet comes from a journal called Infant Behavior and Development and is entitled Newborn Infants Prefer Attractive Faces. And okay, maybe you've spotted the problem here. The study shows how a sample of 16 two-month-old infants spent more time looking at faces deemed attractive by adults than those deemed unattractive. It wasn't able to say exactly what features were making the children look for longer, but it did suggest that infants are born with an innate preference for attractive faces that isn't taught by conditioning. Which is very interesting. However, I do think it's fair to assume that this tweet was not made in reference to News Face. Is that safe to assume? Yes. This study is worthless. It's completely irrelevant to what he's saying. Let's look at the second link. 
This one is called Physical Attractiveness and Reproductive Success in Humans, Evidence from the Late 20th Century United States. And this is a bit closer to what he's talking about. The sample size is a lot bigger than 16. They took participants who graduated from high school in 1957, which is good because the availability of contraception would make this research basically impossible to replicate today. Their data on attractiveness came from yearbook photos, which were mostly based on facial attractiveness. For sake. Although I'm sure a lot of these photos could give you a rough impression of someone's body size, so let's be very generous and give him that. They separated each photo using a point scale from 1 to 11, 1 being not at all attractive, 11 being extremely attractive, and the ratings were given by 33 different judges who were aged 63 to 91 years. Which doesn't really counter the idea that beauty standards are learned, does it? So Jordan Peterson is wrong. Huge. But what I don't think this captures is exactly how wrong he is. And after reading these tweets, I remembered that I had a book called Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. Like, someone gave it to me about a year ago and I just completely forgot about it, so if you're watching, sorry. But thanks to Gobbin Jeeperson, I decided to read the whole thing. In it, the sociologist Sabrina Strings looks at how our preferences for different body types have evolved over time. Because believe it or not, skinny bodies were not always the gold standard in European society. A quick look at Renaissance art will show countless images of curvy, voluptuous women who were once prized as the epitome of feminine beauty. As some of the first slave women started to enter Europe, a small handful of artists were very openly fawning over the appearances of their plus-size black subjects too. Take, for example, the German artist Albrecht Dürer, who did this portrait of a slave called Katharina. Dürer seemed to hold black women's bodies in higher regard even than those of white women. In his work on the African physique, Dürer wrote, I have seen amongst them whose whole bodies have been so well built and handsome that I never beheld finer figures, nor can I conceive how they might be better. So excellent were their arms and all their limbs. And for reference, his four books on human proportion depicted the normal woman as looking like this. Then, towards the end of the Renaissance, two things changed. First, there was the Protestant Reformation, which started to reshape the way people approached eating. Protestantism especially viewed self-discipline as a key indicator of good moral character. From that, a new ideal emerged that stood in direct contrast to what was seen as the Catholic tendency for overindulgence. Scholars and physicians would talk about how gluttony would hindereth the right operation of the soul. The sluggishness that came from excessive eating was said to prevent the mind from contemplation of spiritual pursuits. One preacher likened the devil to a cunning cook, who tempted people with pleasant dishes that would pull people away from the word of God. Plus-size bodies would eventually be seen as a sign of sin and stupidity. And next was the birth of scientific racism. Of course, the idea here was that white Europeans were the most rational and sensible of the races, and one of the ways this superiority was expressed was through their delicate, slim physiques and their disciplined eating habits. Africans, on the other hand, were seen as the products of their warm climate. Idle, sexually voracious, and gluttonous. The link between race and weight was so essentialized that modern race theorists even revived an old theory that blackness was caused by a superabundance of black bile beneath the skin, which in turn was seen as the cause of gastrointestinal disorders and weight gain. Where black women were once presented as unique beauties in the Renaissance, by the 18th and 19th century, they were paraded in front of audiences in freak shows as grotesque sources of voyeuristic fascination. The racial hierarchy was also a hierarchy of beauty, and the plus-size figures of the Renaissance were replaced by svelte figures with tiny waists and, um, long necks, apparently? With plus-size bodies being so intrinsically linked to racial inferiority, this period also saw the rise of good old-fashioned body shaming. 
One of the worst offenders here was the Spectator magazine, who would routinely publish letters by men railing against women who they saw as corpulent and improper. One man even wrote in to complain about women who were skinny, but had the audacity to wear clothes that made them look bigger. Or in his words, The strutting petticoat smooths all distinctions, levels the mother with the daughter, and sets maids and matrons, wives and widows, upon the same bottom. In the meanwhile, I cannot but be troubled to see so many well-shaped innocent virgins bloated up and waddling up and down like big bellied women. Then, by the turn of the 20th century, the horror of overeating had become so pronounced that it produced an epidemic of undereating. An article in the New York Times from 1894 complained that middle and upper class women had become so averse to gaining weight that they were literally starving themselves. This in turn led to widespread efforts from doctors desperately trying to push women back into eating regularly. One of those doctors was none other than John Harvey Kellogg. And since we're on the topic of doctors with weird opinions, we should look at what he had to say. Kellogg believed that thinness was a corollary of illness and the cure was found in added flesh to the body. As a Seventh-day Adventist and outspoken eugenicist, Kellogg didn't really care for the health of black people. He once went so far as to describe them as blood clocks who would eventually become extinct if they were ever left to their own devices. Instead, he would focus his efforts on restoring the health of what he saw as the civilized portion of the human race that being white Anglo-Saxon women. In his own words, the only hope for the race is in the future of its girls. He urged young women to eat more fruits, grains and cracked wheat, as well as plenty of milk and water. By the early 1900s, he had cemented his contribution by selling cases of toasted cereals, mostly wheat, rice and corn, a combination of fruits, nuts and grains, which he called granola, and in a brilliant irony, this Christian white supremacist was also the first person to alter the texture of beans to create soy milk. But despite his success, there was a good bit of trial and error. In 1888, he wrote a piece for the Journal of the American Medical Association, where he argued for the benefits of treating a 50-year-old woman who was suffering from digestive distress by administering oxygen via the rectum. In his own words, there was the steady decline in strength and flesh until the patient was reduced to a skeleton. At this crisis, it was determined to make a trial of the oxygen enema. As a result, most marked improvement began at once. The patient began to gain in flesh, and in a few weeks, the patient was able to return to her home, restored to health. Really? And this was not just a one-off. Even when he did give reasonable advice, for example, he was one of the OG drink lots of water kind of guys, but even then, he still couldn't fight the temptation to administer his treatments from both ends. His enema machine would use several gallons of water on a single patient, and the treatment was then followed with a pint of yogurt, half of which was eaten and the other half Kellogg! So, Kellogg was a mixed bag, and unfortunately, cornflakes didn't really solve the problem. Throughout the 20th century, the glorification of skinny bodies has persisted despite an endless list of medical and psychological downsides. People continue to treat BMI as some kind of gold standard despite it being based on a 200-year-old pseudoscientific model that failed to account for differences in body composition between black and white people and at pretty much everything else. Looking back at our Lobster Daddy's tweet here, it becomes all the more ridiculous that he would describe this, of all things, as authoritarian. If anything, this kind of thing happens in spite of authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is when our beauty standards result in nearly two-thirds of models being told to lose weight by their agencies, more than half of them regularly skipping meals. It's the regular use of diet pills and stimulants, 8% of them at least sometimes losing weight by purging, something that was once routinely recommended in the 1700s by the physician George Cheen. 
who looked like this, by the way. Whenever you find yourself cloiked, gripped, low-spirited, or want natural sleep, you must always have recourse to vomit. Vomiting now and then, as you'll find necessity, will always prevent ale of consequence. And this, with your diet, in one year, will make you as well as you desire. So I learned a lot from this wacky old tweet. But I also had to think, what do I say to the Jordan Peterson fans who might think I'm being a bit unfair on, you know, one of the most famous public intellectuals on earth? Am I just punching down on someone who has clearly lost a bit of his original spark? To which I would say, no. Jordan Peterson has always been like this. There was that time when he tried to tell an atheist that one dose of mushrooms was enough to get people to quit smoking and this was his evidence of a divine experience? Well, you can stop smoking without any sort of supernatural intervention. No, not really. You can't stop smoking without supernatural? There aren't really any, any reliable chemical means for inducing smoking cessation. You can use a drug called bupropion. I think that's the one. It's whatever Wellbutrin is. Um, is that supernatural? To, no, you don't need a supernatural effect, but it doesn't work very well. But if you give people magic mushrooms, psilocybin, and they have a mystical experience, they have about an 85% chance of smoking cessation. Sure, with but, one treatment. But yeah, nothing. but that's kind of like evidence, you know. It's, it's kind of like evidence. So that study he referred to was of patients who had been given doses of psilocybin for eight weeks, and in conjunction with regular cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. And of course, his entire kickstart to fame was when he argued that Bill C-16 would lead to people being jailed for misgendering in Canada. You can read the bill and it makes no mention of misgendering. It's been five years since it was passed and no one has been jailed for using the wrong pronouns. But Peterson did still try to claim vindication by referring to this story about a father who was jailed after misgendering. You can maybe see where this is going. First of all, this case had nothing to do with C-16. The guy in the photo was misgendering, but the criminal part had a bit more to do with the fact that he was publicly sharing sensitive information about his trans child in violation of a court order. The court had ruled that his behavior resulted in the child being exposed to degrading and violent public commentary, which is a pretty shit thing to do, especially given that the child had already made a suicide attempt. So, um, yeah, f that guy. And as for Jordan Peterson, well, he has received quite a lot of backlash for his comments about Yumi. After what he described as an endless flood of vicious insult, unlike this completely not vicious insult, he announced his departure from Twitter.com and has been tweeting regularly ever since. Look, don't worry about this person. Instead, I would say drink water and stay beautiful. Hey, um, you there. I just wanted to say that thanks to all those names going by, as well as my Twitch subscribers and the uh, advertising people, I'm now doing this full time. Yeah. This is my job now. If you want to have your name amongst all these other kind strangers, you can follow the link in the description. You'll also get to see the videos in their draft stages before they're released, you'll get access to the music I make for them, and a bunch of other things. Uh, you can throw me a one-off donation on PayPal if you'd rather. Uh, you know how the internet works. But also, I really just wanted to thank everyone for helping me get this far, and not just the patrons, but also just everyone who's been watching. Um, the fact that there are that many of you out there is really amazing, so yes, see you next time.